And welcome to this panel of the 2021 Six Bridges Book Festival put on by the Central Arkansas Library System. We are highlighting two amazing poets tonight. We've got Susie F. Garcia with us. She is um, sharing with us from her chapbook, A Homegrown Fairy Tale, and also poet Taylor Johnson are sharing their poetry collection, Inheritance. So we're going to get started this evening with Susie. Let me just let you guys know a little bit about her, and then we'll hear from her and um, more from her work. Susie F. Garcia is an executive editor at Nomi Press. She's online editor at the Michigan Quarterly Review and a guest editor for Poetry Magazine. She has an MFA in creative writing with minors in screen cultures and gender studies. Garcia is a Macandista, an alum of the Macondo Writers Workshop, and a former board member for the Latinx Caucus. The poems in her chapbook, A Homegrown Fairy Tale, Engage with the Wizard of Oz, offering a reimagining of coming home after being in a magical land, as well as exploring ideas of sexuality, mental illness, Latinidad, and more. Bone Bouquet's D.A. Powell remarked on her work, Susie F. Garcia's Dorothy is blown apart by gale forces and put together again in a deconstruction of girlhood and its Hollywood irrealities that strike at the very heart of fantasy, faith, and survival. These poems are electric, bursting forth like images on the silver screen, magical, sensual, and powerful. Welcome, Susie. We'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Kelly, for that introduction. And thank you to the festival for having me. This is a really special moment for me. Um, I grew up in Arkansas, but I also grew up in the Central Arkansas Library System. That's where I learned to read. That's where I learned to explore and find new lands via books um, and also new language. So, um, I encourage you to go and look at my blog post on Poetry Foundation about growing up in library systems, about learning how to read, because it's really kind of a tribute to CLS. Um, shout out to Fletcher Library. <laughs> like That's where I grew up. It, I had like my second job there ever. Uh, it bought my first car, no air conditioning, of course. But um, so to be here, a, a festival that I went to every year, it's just, it's not just heartwarming, it's kind of the realization of a very long dream for me. Um, so thanks to all of the organizers and to you, Kelly, and to you, Taylor, um, everyone who's been a part of this. Okay. Uh, a Homegrown Fairy Tale came out almost exactly a year ago, so it's so exciting to continue to talk about these poems with everyone. Um, they they still do kind of live in my brain a little bit. So um, thank you for letting me share them with you. The first poem I'm going to read is Prayer Upon, Upon Waking. I deny this earth. My home is not the gray, the gross, the gone. I am whited out, Dorothy. I become background. Dry Kansas grass and four walls breathe around me. Perfect background for a hashtag selfie. Chola transplant, dark rose lipstick, slick back hair. We were recreating history, but look, we were another generation, yet cannot change a goddamn thing. I have seen a shine without source except self. I have stripped off my scars before, but I cannot paint over them anymore. Now I buy myself a fresh dress, black lace, a new cushion bed to lay in, the kind that closes on top. The second poem I'm going to read is A Dream, A Gale. I was the middle where the Southern and Northern winds met, where the house stood still in an inexact center. We were torn apart at the last moment, darling, and our joints unhinged. The wind was a violence that whipped my hair and when we settled, we did not get all the right parts. My hand has never moved like the water again, a freckle on your nose I'd not seen before. This was not a condemnation, I felt blessed. In Oz, we prism where borders become stateless. Dorothy, you are the last of the miracles. Breathe out, gilded air. 
I started for California, made a stop at the first place there was water. I received word that there was no gold left in Hollywood. Not for me, not for you. Dorothy, it doesn't matter. We can go full burlesque if you want a show in Vegas every night until you're ready to return to Oz. There are lights on the strips too, Dorothy. So this project really started because um, growing up, I felt such passionate relationships with women in books and yet somehow didn't realize that that might be a hint about sexuality. Who knew? So this kind of like relationship with the reader and imagine Dorothy that integrates like sexuality and race um, as well as mental illness, depression and loneliness kind of was a culmination of a lot of these realizations about who not so much who the characters in the book were, but how I saw them through my eyes and how I saw myself through their eyes simultaneously. Um, so in that, in that way, like Dorothy and the speaker become almost one at times where she feels as though Dorothy is the other half and she's trying to see that mirror without Dorothy on the other side. Um, and she's not, she's not doing well with it. Okay, so this poem is entitled Wilderness Wandering. I've been invisible so long, a survival strategy on the fringe, and then I've become my own determination, finding my escape, if any can be had in an ancient Honda and a couple of tanks of gas. My bones, <clears throat> my bones grit against one another. I have been in one place too long, so I will immigrate, seek to be foreign again. Be with me while I search Dorothy. Remember our covenant because I see it in the eyes of every salty body on the dance floor, waves that move me towards you and away again. Summer. I'm dragging veins in poison water, looking for my own face in oil spills, but there is no hope in the muddy mountain tops I try to call home. Together, we shook off the concept of civilization, find a numbness to pain in lips on hips and the sweet dew frozen in our hair. At night, I remember promises for mutiny, but now there is a blue filter over everything and summer presses on me. August is too late for bra bravery and I know I can't breathe through September this year. I stain my mouth in wine, leave my lips on each bar from ocean to ocean. I press the summer back, take night into my teeth. I chew it up, swallow. Journey to Promised Land. At times, I believe it is only adrenaline that propels my car forward. I cannot go up, so I move sideways, push dimensions. The, the air shimmers, yellow dots, heat blur. My voice is raw. I stick out my tongue in the mirror an oyster pale dying out of water. Has my body had enough? I am assemblage, put me together. Last week, I met a collective of riot girls who think they've tapped into utopia and the moon. The light there is only reflection though. But when they describe the twist they feel just behind the breastbone, it almost feels real to me. There's no way we, we can get what we had back when we had hope. Instead, what's la left is this back and forth, except only half of that. What's left is the idea of what could have been. And if I let that go, I know it won't change anything really, except you and me and feelings I never knew on any version of this earth. Just a bit of that idea of our hands together in fear and the sweet smell of wheat beginning to turn. If I let these ideas go, you will eat and sleep and no one will ever wake you too early again. And who would it hurt? I'll build a house on the Louisiana swamp, maybe learn how to write songs on the fiddle, calluses on my fingers, New Testament, but I'm not sure to what. Um, this is the final poem I'm going to share and 
I think that it kind of encompasses a lot of the ideas of what the speaker is looking for when they're looking for love, when they're stuck on earth instead of in awe is trying to find not just Dorothy, but a, a place in that place they think is Dorothy. Um, it's called homesick. I see it in my dreams still, but I think I've pushed it out of my mind. Winds that billow me, a sea the color of the Mississippi, all mud and leaves and a way out. A storm blew and I am joyful in defiance, standing at the window, my cheeks cut by blowing debris until finally I close my eyes against the dirt that comes at my face. Buried in my own home, I feel the comfort of weight on my chest. Knowledge that something finally makes sense. I am young in my dream, and I don't mind the noise that builds until finally my ears fill and burst and find the silence I've been seeking for years now, but I've turned my back on the wind, and I am trying to find a patch on earth instead. I read backwards, search for the right map, the right prayer. Is there only desperate sadness and a loneliness that echoes in my joints at night? A throbbing in my finger bones, and in the cold, I can barely clutch the steering wheel. Instead, I sit in a parking lot and sing along with the radio until my voice cracks, fails, falls. I am not just song, but in togetherness, we, we are song. And at church, I sing half a duet. The choir answers in a version of your voice. Religion splinters and splits. Some churches out east have even turned art deco. And those are where I wear an empire waist. Drink in the back pews instead. And my holy gin, my holy water is gin herbs and lime and an extraterrestrial green. Sometimes I think I can be more than martyr. I can let go of this monopoly on sorrow. Then someone hands me the pills outside of a sacred space and I burn through every emotion I know. I turn up the volume on the radio and I drown out in stereo. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susie. I was over here snapping. I don't know about y'all. Um, great job, great reading. I did drop a link in the chat for everyone to be able to purchase a homegrown fairy tale. Um, just a reminder, if you do have any questions that come up for either of our authors, just drop those in the chat. We're gonna hear from Taylor and then get to all those, have kind of a Q&A session at the end. Um, so without further ado, I will announce Taylor to you guys. Taylor Johnson is originally from Washington, D.C. Their work appears in Paris Review, The Baffler, Scalawag, and elsewhere. Johnson is a Cave Canham Graduate Fellow and a recipient of the Larry Neal Writers Award from the D.C. Commission of Arts and Humanities. Inheritance is a collection of poems that seeks to think through ways in which language, ownership, and identity collide. I'd love to share a sentiment from Ralph Hamilton, the editor, editor of Rhino, who states, the reader of inheritance experiences a singular talent, one daring to construct a form and a language that together explore the fullness of a life in process. They also share Taylor's own succinct description. What I present in these poems are soliloquies of an otherwise socially unimagined interior, my own, ungoverned black. I'll turn it over to you, Taylor. Thank you, Kelly. It was really good to hear from you, Susie. And thank you, Andre, for helping out with the tech. Um, it can be hard, you know, in this uh, very digital format. So thank you so much. And thank you for listening, everybody who's listening. This is Inheritance, came out last year from Alice James Books. Um, and yeah, I'm just gonna read some poems from it. Since I quit their internet service, I'm thinking more about the transitive properties in books, the words, the palimpsest of images accruing in my brain, but more immediately the book in my hand, the cover worn at one end from sweat and gripping it when it comes close. Close as in when I stood up, let one deep exhale when I came to the lines of all fearless happiness from which reaches my life I sing. 
and find it underlined by a beloved stranger. It's like turning the record over, knowing you're hearing what I'm hearing, easing up on the edge of the chair. It's like we're holding hands now at the edge of a white silence from which we are to make a music of our being here, of being moved, wherein our music complements and holds close each other's sound. Sound in the wet room of the tree I met you in. Nothing is said about the water or the fearless trees angled toward and against the light, light that did fall on me, made much of me, light that sings through me. So I'm singing. Ecclesiastes, how to testify. In the marketplace from my voice was everything was meaningless. Knee deep in the mud with my tongue out, monsoon, mason jar, morning glory, must I carry even the idiolect of gravel, glossolalia and stupor of all things, moving and unmoving. I fall in and I fall back out. Oh, exaltation, the Virginia pine grows straight up to deeper blue and most tap roots I'll never see. I was waiting for you to turn around, pretending none of this baffles me, not taking it personally. I forget about money, watching the clouds over Eighth and Ingraham, the clouds a rhubarb colored ship in the sky. To my right, it all grays out, the bats emerging now from the chimneys, the bats listening for the cicada's echo. Echo is a way to create space, is a metaphor for time, time for the cop to move along. I think watching the cop watch me from my porch, fuck 12, the robin on the wire vine, the wire eye, competing with the bats for cicadas, the robin competing reds with the sky, the sky a money for the cicadas, a way to make space time. The cicadas sounding out the future through repetition. A friend says to spend nothing is to keep flexibility in your hands, to keep your youth. Money, the sound of decay. Money, the repetition of waste. Black existential exegesis. This engine and cog business is wigged out. I want nothing we're owed from the ship gig, thence the land whereon modern sound weaned off our cowrie and cached aged conjure. Land whereon our woe is chic and wanted. Shout out to every nigga cajoled into winging it in a crowd, crowing about being the hewer and the hewer subject. Oh, my aching chore choir do upon our ochre echo throughout this land, this cadence gag, our eco ego greeted upon and caged. Grace is our odd crowd which encores green and geodes. Shout out to every nigga dodging age by ignoring human genre fiction gore, ergo we're nowhere, reneging on being owned and renewed weighing nothing like race. Shout out to every nigga eroding off the edge of something else, gossamering the air. The black proletarianization of the bourgeois form isn't Kanye West gospel samples. Oh death, your singular eye. My mother speaks the king's English, makes quiche, makes clove pomanders in winter, pawned her flute, cleaned my elementary school classroom. What is hers? Brilliant song, my mother sotto voce in her chair asking for touch. It is drowning, she means, not freedom. I swam fine, don't you get it? Oh death, my mother is elegant alive entering the blue hole of evening alone. You could reach into the frame, pull her out. Oh, death, I've been crueler, I've watched. Whereas I come into the into to talk with my shadow. From you, I've not hid my face. For in the morning, I make 
and am made by you, beautiful projection, boy in the mirror, boy in my mind. I separate my flesh from my flesh to become more like you, to drown in your holdings. O oh, young Lord of my desire, you are the light I ride to toward, I run from. I eat less and avoid being hailed, anonymous interstitial prince of my undoing, redeemer of my yes. I want to grow into you and then abandon your imprecise naming. I am bequeathed violence, your inheritance, and your rough glamour. I'm made to tarry here with you, thus illumined by your tenuous light. Semiotics. In a dream, I am my father riding through the Thai countryside with a banjo playing itself in the passenger seat, strapped in like a baby. The light falling so thick it makes a brass bowl of the valley, the light articulating green to the day. I want to sing it real, what I saw with his eyes, like a river sings to an ocean until the river is a cloud. Sing the song a cloud sings to a mountain. Sing it true and liquid the light, the light falling. I resonate, I green, I steam ring and undo my face. I let the new light undo my face. I become my father's distance in the temple, the glinting Buddha head casting gold between the floor and his frayed shadow. His fallow voice repeats the mantra, leave, 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 as he passes glass beads between his fingers. My father rocks side to side in prayer. I become that groove. I weep as my father in devotion and anger. We write the same letter to my mother. You are, you did, you, 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 you. I become my father as speed on a highway, the tape deck playing associations. Father is to fathomed as phantom is to what? The answers draw a sentence across the windshield as crude lines. I'm a banjo driving, trying to read the blueprint my father left. I think it was his voice. My idea of abstraction is white lightning. Halfway between Ganyan and Ophelia, imminent splendor. It doesn't matter what I don't know. Clouds creating a blue fissure in the sky. Whose grammar, whose sadness hurries forth. I want to speak to order. Soybeans, corn, wheat rose brown to torpor. Mercy, protozoan. Water shorn, hotly I listen in the pines for my green name. Whoever can stop reasoning, stop. Is it too much to ask to be remade? I who've just begun. The Daggio of light, copper hued diadem hanging on twilight's hem. Virginia sun, I'm yet released from the sharp language of being. Make me another by morning lest I stay in this vestibule wholly unmade. I'll just read um, one more. I think we have time for one more. Thank you for listening. A kind of wildness descends and across the expanse, the attendant wind drone, it's one feckin' song. When I'm so tender in the thick of rot, I let all the morning wet spread a plague across this threadbare vessel that holds in what hums, what rushes beneath. Give as the ground gives. Make of me your groveling tongue, your dust, your possessed, possessing, never let up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Taylor. That was amazing. More snaps to you. Um, again, if anyone has questions for either poet, please drop them in the chat. 
thank everyone for, for being here and listening. I will, everyone's just, just loving your readings. So um, I'm going to go ahead and just, just start us off with some questions. Um, I'm going to start one for Susie, just kind of a lighter question. You know, your homegrown fairy tale does, of course, um, draw from Wizard of Oz. I'm quite curious, you know, you being a literary person, if you ever read the entire Frank Baum Oz collection and kind of drew inspiration from that, or if you kind of, you know, envision yourself more being in the background of the 1939 classic film that we all love. Yeah, um, I'll go ahead and say I don't do things by half. You can see some of my Wizard of Oz classic books up here. I have some first editions. I have some, like, I always call them the Criterion edition, um, but that's not right. Like the Norton edition version. Uh, my partner always gets me Wizard of Oz books whenever they come out. Um, and it's not just the Wizard of Oz uh, books that I'm inspired by or by the 1939, the Return to Oz film. That's a really good one for Halloween BTW, folks. If you have not seen The Return to Oz, that's amazing. But it also engages in mental illness in a really interesting way um, because she's actually running away from an asylum in that one. Um, you know, I, I, the, I would say the classic con canonical text that I don't engage in with that much in the Wizard of Oz realm would actually probably be Wicked. You know, uh, when I was talking with some people about my book, they were like, I'm surprised you're not seeing a lot more Wicked in there since you're really into, I, I'm into theater. I went to Parkview, for those of you in Little Rock, I, you know, that's a theater magnet. And um, what's more of an influence to me though is Wicked, which is not, I mean, yeah, which is not, not Wicked. <laughs> what am I saying? Uh, oh my gosh, why can't I think of the other musical? What's the other musical that's The Wizard of Oz? Um, Michael Jackson. Uh, somebody in the chat knows what I'm talking oh, about. Oh, The Wiz. Thank you. Why well, I kept saying The Wiz. So The Wiz is a lot more influential to me than Wicked. Thank you. I could not get there. The fact that The Wiz is so raced and so much fun. And actually, when I was at Parkview, we did The Wiz. So um, I've been kind of, I've read all of L. Frank Baum's books, all of the books that came after that weren't written by Baum. Um, and yeah, I engage in Wizard of Oz whenever I can. I'm really lucky to have met some also really cool people who are also into the Wizard of Oz and having, like, it's it's a weird place. Um, it, I did a really great interview with the Versus podcast with Denez Smith and Franny Cho about my Wizard of Oz obsession. Uh, over on the poetry website. So <laughs> if you want to hear more about that really wild Wizard of Oz obsession, definitely go grab that. Well, thank you, Susie. I, you know, I love hearing that, that all that backstory of what kind of works into your mind and inspiration for that. Um, so another question for, for Taylor now, I'd actually like to just go ahead and ask you about the, the photo that's on that, that cover there. Um, would you share a little bit about kind of how that, how you found that or you know, to me, as, as you're reading through some of these poems, it really does have a reminiscence of some of the places that you talk about, possibly like, you know, growing up with your grandparents. Um, is that where you drew from? Is it an actual place, you know? Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, this photo is by the artist Dana Lawson. The photo is called Trap Car. Um, and I, I just loved the photo for some years. And I was able to meet her a few years ago before my book came out and asked her if I could use it. You know, she gratefully agreed, uh, thankfully agreed to it. Um, and uh, I mean, I, if you don't know the work of Dana Lawson, I'll just write her name in the chat. She's pretty dope. Um, yeah, so I, uh, what I like about this photo is that um, it feels active, you know what I mean? I think when I'm looking at something that's, that's a still image and I can still kind of sense the movement in it, that's what I really dig about it. There's a... Uh, you know, something to uh, playing good music and then kind of stepping out the car and letting the outside participate in that. Um, I really dig that. Um, yeah. So that's why that's why I chose. And then, of course, there are the pines right there, too. Yeah. Trap car, Dina Lawson. Yeah. Awesome. We'll have to look into more of her work. It's a very nice picture. Um, yeah. So just kind of Talking about that that photo and how it's used, I'd also like to bring up with you, Taylor, the um, 
the form that you use in your poetry and in the, in the book in itself, um, that form that you use reflects kind of the element of time and space played throughout your poems, uh, the space that the poems actually take up or the white space used on the page. And then also the, the picture itself, which you spliced and kind of injected in different ways throughout the book. Um, it's just so interesting how the ones that are smaller, narrower, reserved for the more fleeting moments you talk about, be it intimate bliss or a realization of deepened awareness. Um, these bulkier stanzas are full of all the juicy details observed, questions asked as you had the chance to sit in them and those experiences. And then you seem to draw out the poems heavy laced with indecision, identity, and self-awareness with this extra spacing that you gave. Um, how organic or intentional is this? Is it something that as you're writing, it just is kind of a process or you go back in the editing portion of your book? Yeah, I'm, I'm, that's, thank you, Kelly. That's, I mean, that's a wonderful frame into that kind of large question. So the I'll talk about the inside photo, which is a photo that I took um, just I was on a train from DC to Alabama and I took it off the side just while the train was moving. Um, and the person who designed the book, uh, they, I didn't know that the photo was gonna be included or spliced in the way that it is. So that was a, a nice surprise to me. And I really appreciate it. I think that it, um, it does something for the movement of the book. Yeah, so that's the inside photo. And then if you flip more, you can see how the, the photo is kind of spliced up, yeah. Um, on the different pages, right? Um, and yeah, I think what you what you said about um, how the poems appear. I mean, yeah, I I tend to write in in just paragraphs. Um, some of, some of which I read, and then I'll I'll lineate as I see fit. Um, and I think that the paragraph is a really good room to think inside of. So there's a lot of kinetic motion happening in those in those paragraphs that are kind of tight on the page and then the other ones, you know, there's a lot more room for breath, um, such as the last poem that I read or a few of the other ones where uh, there's, you know, uh, distinct white space between words or phrases. Um, yeah, so it, it, it all kind of comes as I feel it, you know what I mean? I'm not setting out to say, I'm gonna write a poem that looks a particular way. Um, I kind of just let it happen in the way that it does. Awesome. Well, thanks kind of for going more into that. It's something that you definitely, as you, as you get into the book, you definitely notice, oh, this, this feels a bit more intimate or this has room to breathe. Yeah. I love that you can pick up on that too. Cause I think it's, it's not necessarily intentional on my side. You know what I mean? I have my personal feelings about the poems, but I love that you're able to enter into it in that way. I appreciate hearing that. I'm going to um, turn it over to Susie and ask a question again guys um, if you're listening if anything comes up just drop it in the chat and we'll be sure and address those it's a little bit of a, a longer question about identity but you mentioned in the return to oz the mental health aspect and i, I know this kind of goes into there that the themes of identity and home grown fairy tale highlight a catharsis that the writer goes through to find and rediscover themselves um, yes after a broken heart but you also play on depression or at least I picked up on that being someone that, you know, struggles with that myself um, in at the last, as well as self-harm that you touched on in the poem I have invested. Uh, you bravely write of a mental health struggle, but then of course things begin to change. I loved in um, I circle cities in the sky, the line, I pray not to you, Dorothy, not anymore. I pray to remind myself it's possible. Turn that around to yourself. And then um, that poem, Hope, when you, you cut your hair, the sound of scissors through my curls roared in my ears like a plane taking flight. Um, just even reading that, I wanted to just cheer as I read those. Uh, the impact of romance on mental health is so relatable, I think, to all of us, yet not prevalent enough in the conversations held around these topics. Um, so, so, you know, thank you for your bravery to inject these subjects into your book. I'd just love to know if that was a conscious goal that you had in writing this. Um, oh, that's a good question. I think that I have and always will be writing about mental illness because I live in mental illness. I 
like my depression is very real. Um, it is uh, going to always be an active part of my life. I'm always going to have that struggle. Um, same with anxiety, same with some other issues I have, and just like my physical disabilities, it's going to be something that I'm going to incorporate in my writing forever, um, both consciously and unconsciously, I think. Um, and, and I would even say that it's not about the breakup in this one as much as it is about just loneliness and identity in general, especially queerness. When you're coming through that kind of situation where you're coming to terms with your queerness, it can be very lonely, um, especially if you're not in a community. Uh, and growing up, I wasn't in a queer community. Um, I don't think I, I don't, it just wasn't around me. So for me, my, my queerness it was such a slow discovery. It was so slow. Um, and it definitely exacerbate, exacerbated my already present depression. Um, so while Dorothy's there and her rejection is hurting, it's a lot more about like, how do I live in a queer world when I don't understand how to be queer, when I don't understand what that like maybe the bedrock of my queerness in this case, Dorothy. So it, it is Dorothy, but it could have been anyone. It was kind of that relation, a, a queer relationship in and of itself that brought on um, this new discovery of self. So Oz is more representative of that queer community, the queer life. It's not perfect. It's very dangerous. It can be very hard, um, especially for people of color. Um, and it's, but it also, it was a community and it is a community. And so for this character to struggle through both depression and this loss, this connection to that community via Dorothy, um, I think that loneliness is just continuously dealing with that issue and finding moments of community and saying, no, this isn't my community though. Like the riot girls, they have their community, but that's not mine. Or, you know, whatever's happening in these churches where they're dressing in art, art deco, that's a good community, but it's not mine. So she's traveling trying to find her community um, that she thinks only exists with Dorothy and not really recognizing that um, it's not just about Dorothy. Thank you. That's a really great answer. I think one that a lot of us can relate to as well. But um, I think with both of you, Taylor and Susie, you know, it is so important, at least for me, and I think all of us to hear these stories from people that look different than us, that are, are in those different circles than us, that have different struggles than us. It's just so important. It expands our, our mindset and consciousness and our understanding of each other. Um, so going ahead and addressing and just thanking you both for, for bringing those stories to us in, in your forms and in your books. Um, so Taylor, I'll, I'll jump over to you. Just continuing on identity, of course, your um, book inheritance, that's just laced all throughout, um, which is greatly appreciated. And it's, it's great to hear from that viewpoint and all the questions asked. I think a couple things that really stood out to me uh, in the poem Selfhood, the line wearing today, the di diacritical preconception of otherness. I mean, that just kind of stopped me in my tracks right there. Um, and then again, in June, D.C., you say a new friend asked me where my wildness, wildness lives. And I remembered I have a body. Um, you know, they're both just such great reminders that there's so much more to identity than this physical self, you know, than the skin we live in. Uh, so much has to be worked out in our mind and our heart. And yes, that's, that's often hard. Uh, we deal with mental illnesses. You amplify the oneness possible in looking beyond what's in front of us. Uh, so bravo for that. Um, I guess, again, the same, was that something that you were conscious of as you wrote to kind of get that message across or something that came more organically? Yeah, it's definitely something that I was not conscious of at all. I mean, I think I, in the years that I was writing these poems, I was really just trying to write poems, you know what I mean? Like, I wasn't conscious, conscious of this becoming a book or anything like that. These were just poems that have happened to, you know, sound together and come together at the same time. Um, yeah, I I dig the idea of of identity being something that's malleable and 
something that you know is is present you know in in the ocular centric sense of seeing but also present in this other like spiritual way um so i think that a lot of what i'm trying to do and at least a lot of what um i think i was thinking about was was how how myself was made um and it's not like that's what I come to the poems asking, you know what I mean? Um, it's just what what happens because of my internal asking, you know? Yeah, hope that makes sense. Thank you for the question. It does. Uh, I mean, of course, usually what ho- happens organically is better than we even intended. Yeah, so. definitely, definitely. Um, well, I'm gonna, um, again, guys, drop any questions in the chat. Uh, we've got one from, from Bradley. Um, so I guess both of you guys, this is a question for both poets. Which poets or writers influenced you as youth? Yeah, I was talking to some uh, some students today and, and asked a similar question. I read a lot of John Donne when I was in high school, um, sort of holy sonnets and, and that kind of poetry, George Herbert. Um, and then also reading The Transcendentalist. And then I read Invisible Man a lot as a, as a youth as well. Um, I found Amir Baraka in my high school years, and I really, you know, dig him and appreciate his language and what he was doing. Uh, yeah. So I didn't start reading poetry until probably community college. Um, I was really scared of it. <laughs> like I had picked up Wordsworth, and I was like, "We are using the same word." I do not feel like we're using them in the same way. I'm like, it, it really alienated me. Um, but I don't think that that means I wasn't listening to poetry. Like, I get, I, like, it's hard. I've been talking about this a lot, but it's so true. I feel like Arkansas is really full of poetry. Um, and I think that that means I grew up with poetry just in a different way. I mean, how can you grow up in Little Rock and not know how to tell a story? If you don't help know how to tell a story, then I guess you're quiet at lunch because nobody wants to hear from you. Um, so, I mean, like I learned from those around me and um, I don't think of myself as a particularly narrative poet all the time, but those narrative elements are really a part of me because of how I grew up. And I think the South has a lot to do with that language that I've been able to access. Yeah, and I mean, both of you have spent time in the South and the North, correct? Does that really influence kind of the backgrounds in some of your writing? I think only Arkansas would call Michigan the North. Um, (laughs) Generally, they think of Michigan as like Midwest. Uh, But yeah, I mean, until we moved for grad school, my partner and I lived in Little Rock until 2012. That's where I grew up. So absolutely, every single word I write is dripping with with Arkansas, and it's dripping with my miss of Arkansas. I really miss Arkansas. I'm super sad I'm not there. I know the fair is coming. Um, So (laughs) um, all sorts of like, yeah, everything I I write is definitely going to always have some South in it. I hope at least. I'd love to maintain that for the rest of my life, no matter where I live. I treasure it. How about you, Taylor? I mean, I know you're from DC, but you know, you yeah. talk a lot about the woods, the tall grass, the sorghum, yeah. the corn. So DC is below the Mason Dixon line um, for everyone who needs to know that. It is technically a southern city. And if you if you are from there, you know that. Um, but I also grew up uh, for a lot of my childhood um, in the Tidewater region of Virginia, which is uh, about three hours south. DC uh, and, and on the water surrounded by Chesapeake Bay, Potomac River, um, where there were, you know, pine trees and various uh, large scale crops. Um, yeah, and and I guess just being Black in America, there's, there's always something um, Southern about what's happening, our, our position geographically and psychically, I guess. 
So I do have a question from John for Susie. How has your work as an editor influenced your own poetry and vice versa? That's a really good question. I am very lucky to work with amazing poets all the time. Um, and they definitely influence me. I've learned, even when I'm working on critical books, like um, the one I did with Roberto Tejada or Susan Briante, I'm learning things that are exploring, that are making my brain explore. Um, and then I work with poets that make me question how language works in really interesting ways, like Vanessa Villarreal. Um, or even right now at Poetry Magazine, I get to see all of these brilliant writers and learn how to write, read each one of them. And when I learn how to read them, I am also kind of bringing them into my own brain as a writer, into my own heart as a writer. So, um, you know, my work as an editor, in, like people are like, you seem to work a lot. <laughs> like, how do you have time to write? And I'm like, my brain is just very luckily influenced by these writers and it inspires me. So um, I think that, you know, and my work as a writer definitely <laughs> inspires my work as an editor because I can recognize sometimes some of the pitfalls we all fall into. Um, I was meeting with an author the other day who was like, I started this project in this specific way. It got me through, I'm not changing it. And I was like, you have to let the premise go when the premise doesn't work for you anymore. But it's so hard. It's hard to let go of what got you there even when it's not holding you up anymore. Um, so definitely things that I've recognized as problems in my own writing um, make it easier for me to kind of talk to other writers and definitely to sympathize with them for sure because writing's freaking hard. Thank you for that. Um, Y'all yeah, just continue to drop those questions. There's some good ones coming in. I'm going to, I'm, I'm glad I'm getting asked on my own. This is nice. Uh, so I've got, I've got another one for Taylor, if you don't mind. So uh, personally, one of my favorite elements, I know there's a lot in your collection, but it was the, the mention of and the attention brought to music. That was a big treat for me. Um, I'm going to actually read a line from ASM Can't Fill My Face. You say, the music of a quarter in your pocket when I need it was all I needed to continue. I mean, that, for example, embodies this music that you speak about, be it the go-go sounds or the horns you constantly bring up or the music of the woods. You know, it seems to act as like this third party assisting you in progression throughout the events and stages you write about. Um, I'd love to know, you know, that stood out to me so much because music is so influential in my life is that uh, the same with you is this reflect your real life experience kind of a, as a way of a form of therapy or something to assist you? Yeah, I mean, I think with that poem, so ABM is a, it's the name of a go-go band and Can't Feel My Face is just one of their songs. And go-go is the indigenous music of DC, percussive uh, call and response kind of sound. Um, and it, it, it is in everything that I, that I think about and that I do. And I think a lot of the poems at least what, what I can see in them now is some of them are trying to mimic that uh, recursive syntax of, of go-go music, of the sound that is what I grew up with. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm influenced by what I listen to, you know what I mean? Be it John Coltrane or like my grandfather or my friends, you know what I mean? Or strangers on the street or, or just listening in the woods. So I think listening is a big part of my practice as just a human being. And it happens to come into my poetry as well. Thank you. Thank you for kind of talking a little bit more about that. Again, I just, I loved it. Even just having the music themselves question, you know, your thoughts was mm -hmm. really great. Um, so another one for Susie. So obviously you kind of reframed Dorothy for us in your homegrown fairy tale. Culture paints her as a female figure, innocent, lost in seeking and you bring in the more heavy roles, so lover, uh, confidant, family member even, and then of course morphing into a personal savior. Uh, would you say that this, in doing so kind of perhaps on a larger scale, asks us all to rethink the impact of our cultural icons, or is it from a whole different place, you know, 
more highlighting how love can take us into otherworldly states and have us question our beliefs. Yeah, that's an awesome question. I think that, you know, Dorothy is much more complex than she appears um, in the movies, in the books, as far as girls kind of mean sometimes. Like one of the friends, one of her friends, I can't remember if it was the Scarecrow or if it was Jack Pumpkinhead. Somebody gets washed down a river and they get on the, and she and her other friends get on the other side and they're like, that sucks anyway and you're just like you just your friend just died you think your friend is dead girl um so i think that there's some sort of like weird cruelty that i was interested in as Dorothy. and so when she's portrayed in such an innocent way in films i do think it kind of strips personhood from woman simultaneously like women are innocent but they are also more complex they're also not innocent they're also like they're also lovers they're also um heartbreakers they're also i mean like this one idea of womanhood presented by perhaps the mass icon of dorothy just it's not even representative of dorothy let alone the kind of complex womanhood that that we've seen uh, come into our realities and hopefully into this book um, so I think it was kind of pushing against like, and also it was pushing against like our relationship with, with what we read a little bit too. You know, it's not a one way relationship when we read something, we bring something to that book as well. Um, and so what was I bringing into my reading of Dorothy? I unknowingly was bringing in my own queerness, my own need for relationships, et cetera, as I grew older. Um, so how, and I was losing my own innocence and in becoming more mature, becoming a lover, becoming a woman, becoming a friend. So as I saw myself change, I also saw Dorothy change. And I hope that that's kind of what I'm exploring there. All right, thank you for elaborating on that. Uh, we do have a question for Taylor from Kevin. They ask, is the music of New Orleans reflected in your more recent poems? Um, I don't know about that. Um, I don't live there anymore, so maybe it'll come up now that I don't live there. Um, but we'll see. Yeah, my, my grandparents are from New Orleans, so I think that the sound was always a part of my life. Um, but I wonder if you mean like particularly, you know, American improvisational music, jazz music, um, which I'm always thinking about already. So. Yeah, or if you mean bounce music, which is something that I heard, uh, you know, every weekend. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if that's has influence. I think it, whatever I hear influences me, you know. Um, but I can't say explicitly whether the particular sounds we associate with New Orleans have come in yet, though I think that they are innately a part of my body because those are my people, you know. You do mention the horns a lot, and which I know is in the New Orleans music. Is that part of the go-go as well? Well, yeah. I mean, there's there's that sound in go-go music as well, but also in jazz. And I think I mentioned horn in in you know poems about Miles Davis or the Miles Davis uh, mm -hmm. blue and green poem, and then uh, maybe maybe the one at the end of uh, where I'm listening to Christian Scott, who is a trumpet player, who's from New Orleans. Um, yeah, I I I think that the those kind of things uh, punctuate more than anything emotion rather than place, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so I could be thinking about uh, a particular horn sound and, and be in Brooklyn as I was in the, the poem which mentions Miles Davis. Um, yeah, I think the location probably comes in much later, if, if at all, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and I kind of begin to wrap us up. This has just been so great. I mean, especially just hearing from both of you, hearing your readings and hearing the insights that you got to share with us. Um, I did not, Susie, have a copy of your book to hold up. Do you have one that maybe you can hold up? I know everyone's seen Taylor's and then there's Susie's. And again, we've got links for both of those in the chat. But if you missed those, if you'll just go to the CALS website and go to the Six Bridges, you can find our direct panel. Um, there's also a direct link that talks about the books and where to buy them. Definitely get your hands on those. Um, 
So I I guess I'd just love for both of you to take a turn and share with our our audience where the best best platform is for our listeners to find you and follow along in your, your literary journey. Um, I guess I can put my website here. That's probably the best place. Uh, and then that way you can contact me through email. Email is probably the best thing. I'm not really active on the other platforms like that, uh, but I'll put my website here. And then also I can link to the book as well. Thank you. How about you, Susie? Yeah, my website as well, just susiefgarcia.com. Um, you can find me on Twitter. I've got to be honest. I tweet a lot about mundane things that you may not be that interested in. I think I bought a new caftan that was like, I think my big tweet for this week. So um, <laughs> if you're only interested in poetry, I would suggest yeah. a website uh, instead. In, in but yeah, you can catch me on Twitter too. At Susan. Y'all are too busy writing. People just need to check out the real stuff on your websites. <laughs> yes, I am too busy writing. I am not scrolling on TikTok. <laughs> And I believe before we jumped on here live, um, you know, Susie, I know you're a guest editor at Poetry Magazine, and you guys mentioned in the December issue coming out that Taylor's poems will be in there and featured. So everyone be sure and get a, a copy of those. It's going to be the December issue of Poetry Magazine. And then, of course, get the books. That's that's where the good stuff's at. So thanks again mm-hmm. to either of you. Have anything you, you'd like to add? Just a huge thank you. I think I missed saying thank you to Andre earlier, but thank you to yes. Andre for your help with the tech. Um, thank you to everybody for coming, to Bradley and Kevin and uh, everyone who put this together, Kelly for being amazing, and Taylor. I'm just so, I feel really lucky to be here with your with your poems. Um, so thank you for sharing those with us. Yeah, likewise, Susie. It's good to hear from you. Thank you, Kelly, for these really good questions. And thanks for everybody listening. Appreciate it. Okay. Well, again, thank you both, Taylor and Susie and Andre, for helping us out. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, Everyone have a great evening. Follow these poets, get their books. See you guys later.